today. Um, welcome to a Cummins Powers Women Town Hall, um, where we are going to focus today on the role of men and boys in achieving, well, that was an uncomfortable chuckle. It was. Yeah. Puff the course. It, Is it? Yeah, yeah. Nice. They were, ho they were hoping they weren't going to talk about us, that's why. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I promise that the goal today is not to get more men to stop putting dirty dishes in the sink. Mm. Oh, we're not going to do that. Um, I just want to tell you before I introduce our special guests that in our audience today are uh, Cummins employees interested in gender equality, including our Cummins Powers Women Ambassadors, who um, tend to work on community oriented issues to gender equality. We have people from our internal women's resource group uh, who tend, but not exclusively, to focus on Cummins and how we can do a better job achieving gender equality. We have some special guests from the community, um, including some of our special partners that we work on with Black and Brown Equity. Welcome in Indianapolis. And then, of course, we're live streaming this to Cummins locations around the world. So it's a big, exciting day. And we have Alicia Toro here, too. And we have Alicia Toro. Alicia, raise your hand. Who is welcome? Who is uh, visiting from India? And Alicia was one of the, uh, is an expert on gender equality and works primarily right now in India. We met her in our great India trip. Uh, with Rise Up, so welcome. Today we have two fantastic speakers, uh, one of which is our very own CEO, Tom Leinberger, who will remind us why gender equality is important to him and what we're doing at, at Cummins. He has other stuff to say, if you know Tom, he has lots to say. <laughs> <laughs> we are also joined by Gary Barker, um, president and CEO of Promundo, who is one of our, which is one of our nonprofit partners uh, in Cummins Powers Women. Cummins Powers Women started in 2018 with sort of just an idea um, to work globally on the problem of gender bias and inequality. Um, today, we have over 5,000 employees who volunteer uh, in their communities, uh, and we've made more than $20 million of grants to try to solve this problem that we're all here to discuss today. To our audience members, hopefully we will have time after we hear from Gary and Tom for questions. Uh, Avril Schutte and Chauncey Cox, raise your hands, um, are both our program leaders for Cummins Powers Women and they will have um, microphones to, uh, walking around talking to you. Okay, so Tom Leinbarger is our CEO. Um, and has been, of course, a dynamic voice uh, for opportunity, um, not just gender uh, opportunity, but opportunity of all sorts um, for many years, inside and outside of Cummins. Um, Gary Barker is a leading global voice in engaging men and boys in advancing gender and positive masculinities. He's the CEO and founder of Promundo, which has worked for over 10 years in nearly 40 countries on the role of men and boys. He's the co-founder of Men Care, a global campaign working in more than 50 countries to promote men's involvement as caregivers. He leads the International Men and Gender Equality Survey, which is the largest survey ever of men's attitudes and behaviors related to violence, fatherhood, and gender equality. He's the co-author of the 2015, 17, 19, and 21 State of the World's Father Reports. I'm not sure what you're doing in the off years, <laughs> so I'm sort of intrigued by that. He's advised the United Nations, the World Bank, numerous national governments, and key international foundations and corporations uh, on strategies to, strategies to engage men and boys, in 2017, he was named by Apolitical as one of the 20 most influential people in gender policy in the world. He holds a PhD in developmental psychology and has won numerous awards. Thank you both for being here today. 
I think um, I need to improve my bio. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to shorten my... <laughs> I was wondering if I needed a shorter stool or something like that. <laughs> your bio is good. Tom, That's amazing. Uh, many of us have heard your story, but some have not. Can you um, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your background and your life, mm. and why gender equality is important to you personally? Yeah, well first uh, I wanna say how grateful I am to be here with all of you. I do not take for granted sitting together with people again, see, seeing people and being seen, and now these meetings are really meaningful to me, so I really appreciate you all being here and uh, the chance, and of course I'm really grateful to you, Gary. I'm grateful both for the fact someone of your talent and skill has dedicated your life to something so important and that you're here to talk with us about it, so thank you so much. Um, Mary, to your question, um, I grew up uh, in California in the Bay Area. My, um, my mom and dad were very young when, when they were married uh, in, in 20 and 19. They both left homes that were, um, they, they, they were difficult homes for them for a bunch of reasons. There was alcoholism in my dad's side of the family and my mom's mom died of cancer when she was a teenager and, and then there was a, a remarriage and not all that went quite as well as they'd like. So anyway, they both had good reasons to leave home before they were done with high school and did some work. And then they met together at San Jose State College in California, got married. Um, uh, I was born um, after they were married. Um, but let's just say there was, there, there was some time urgency to getting married, so they did. Um, and then, so, I, so they were young and they were you know, not planning necessarily for all that to happen as fast as it did. And um, so my mom dropped out of school um, to take care of me and my father uh, worked, uh, needed to work and work for his grandfather um, who he had, a, my grandfather, he, his father, who he had not a great relationship with. His, it, it was, uh, his, his father and, and mother were divorced because of alcoholism. So anyway, it was tough. They really had a tough time and they were both working hard trying to make it work, and, but it didn't work. Their marriage was rocky and um, high amplitude, mostly in the negative sense. Um, and so by the time I was six, uh, they were divorced. And so my mom just did all the work. My mom raised me and my brother, who was uh, four years younger than me. She went back to school when, when, my, when they split. She, got a, she uh, finished her degree in occupational therapy. She worked. We were on welfare during most of that time or some kind of government assistance and um, we lived with another family for part of that time. Um, and remarkably, as I stand here today, I can't remember a time where I felt like less than in some significant way. I'm sure, I know my genes weren't fancy enough and things like that, but I mean, not in a significant way, not in a way that made me feel like I didn't, um, like I couldn't do okay. And, um, and I'm very convinced that if my mom had not persevered in the way she did and just found new ways to do things that I wouldn't be here today. And um, that's left me with a few things. First is uh, I take my marriage very seriously. I never take it for granted in any way. Um, I love my wife and I invest a lot in making sure that it, it stays t a, a good marriage with, with all our struggles. Um, and I have two wonderful daughters and I, I really care a lot about them too. So it's made me take my family and my parenting really and, and, and spousal thinking really seriously. But it's also made me comfortable with female role models. Yeah. My mom was a tough, you know, she's not perfect. Yeah, she says a lot of goofy stuff. And of course, the older she gets, the more goofy stuff she says. But um, she is, she's a tough person. And she persevered through a lot of stuff with very few advantages. You know, she's not, She's not brilliant, she's not, she wasn't rich, she wasn't, she's not physically skilled, she just worked hard. She just gave it what she had and made me feel like I could do the same thing. Um, so I think part, part of my story is this story that I, female role models work fine for me. Part of my story is that I have two daughters who are you know, my, my pride and joy and I think about them and I think about the world I want for them and, I, and the world that I look at today isn't the world that I want for them. And they experience things regularly that I 
don't think they should experience. And um, not all of it, but most of it comes from men. Um, so I do think that, that, that I feel strongly that women can be leaders. I tell them that all the time. I, I, I feel like they can do whatever they want. I want them to be able to do whatever they want. I think they're capable of it. Let's just say it that way. And I don't feel any differently when I meet women from around the world. Um, one more small story, I'll stop. And that is, I, I remember when um, my, our former colleague, Anant Talakar, took me to Faltan in, in India. And um, we had just set up the, the plants there. It was, in, it was in a village in India. And you know, that was, there was a number of villages that were quite poor around there. And I visited the villages. And some of them were in, you know, they had mud huts still. And they were burning uh, dung for heat. And um, people were living 30 to 40 years, and you, you, usually on average, and then uh, usually dying of some respiratory illness. And the, there was, the school was not very good, and the crops were very poor. And then we invested in the community and, and helped. But what I noticed is we had hired a number of young women from the community into our plant that we opened. And I walked by those women, and they were all wearing traditional Indian, Indian uniforms, and I thought, I really thought they were going to wet themselves when I walked by. They were so terrified of me. Not only am I tall and you know, intimidating, but it's the CEO, and, and they were so terrified. Honestly, I thought they, they just wanted to disappear. And I went back five years later or four years later, and the plant was just booming. We were you know, building, doing all these amazing things. And those women stood up in front of me, presented, said, I'm in charge. Four years later, they were in charge, and they were running the place. So that's what they were capable of, is being in charge. But if you'd seen them four years earlier, you would have assumed they were capable of none of that, because, just because of where they started and what they were given. So my story is one of possibility and opportunity, I think. That's great. So Gary, you know, similarly, I think uh, we are all shaped by our background and experiences. Why, how did you become interested in gender equality and, and, and why? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I guess a bit like Tom, I can, I will go back to, you know, my parents, I was Southern California was where I was raised. My father was a social worker, which is a pretty feminine profession. Um, and really modeled, you know, and what he did, his cause was the care of children, and particularly the care of children who had ended up in foster care or adoption or needed support, mostly because of the violence of men. And our dinner table conversations were often about those issues. My siblings were both adopted, situations of mostly issues of men's abandonment of families. Um, and in the outside world, we moved to Houston later on, the outside world was some pretty harmful ideas about masculinity and men, including a school shooting in my high school, including in my first year in university, a group of young men um, took a uh, intoxicated young woman to a dorm room and all had sex with her. And my dorm, uh, my school did something really radical. The only thing they did was after that, you had to register a guest in your dorm. There was zero talk about it as an issue. Um, so I had you know, this version of caring manhood at home and a world around me where there was a horrendous examples of men's violence. Um, I later ended up working internationally, um, went to Brazil to coordinate a project with UNICEF on girls who were being sexually exploited. And we went to bars where men were paying for sex and we were mapping how they got there. And I kept saying, I wanna know about the men at the bar. Why are they here? And why are some of them paying for sex with underage girls, but some of them aren't? But I don't see any of them telling their buddies don't do that. And it became really easy at some point to say, well, it's those men who do that. And then to say, well, wait a minute, we're all in this conversation. Um, what do we do about that? And I asked in very annoying ways to UNICEF and others, what are we doing about the men? And I found that if I asked that enough and with enough good questions, we finally got some funding to start some work and started Promundo in Brazil. Um, and it was still, uh, you know, that cause was off in the world, but it became even more real to me when together with my Brazilian wife, we moved to the US for me to work on my PhD in child development, which is we learn how children thrive and survive in the world. 
um, pretty useful you know, profession, almost all women in my course. <laughs> And we decided, you know, the winter was quite cold in Chicago, and we had decided to have a child. Um, and my Brazilian wife, because Brazil has four months paid maternity leave, 100% of your salary for everybody who's on a payroll. And as you know, in this country, we have zero days paid, covered by the government. And my Brazilian wife said, well, this is a fine backwards country you have brought me to. Um, what are we going to do now? She's a therapist and works in public health. She was the main breadwinner, so it made sense for me to be the stay-at-home dad, trying to juggle a PhD. And the, the real-life experience of how invisible the care of children is, the unearned privilege that I had where women were offering to come give me help all the time with my daughter. I did occasionally want to say, you know, I'm doing a PhD in child development. I think I know something about this. <laughs> but women looked at me and thought I didn't know anything about what I was doing, the pediatrician and everyone else. Um, to my fellow graduate students who think that caregiving is important, who thought that they would say, oh, you're not coming to the group study today because you're babysitting for your daughter. It's like, no, it's called being a caregiver. Um, so I had you know, kind of a real life experience of what is it like, the invisible nature of the care that we provide. And yet it was for me a foundational experience of um, my relationship with my daughter and us as a couple and all of that. So, it became real to me to say, what is it that we do about making care and caregiving part of how we talk about men? Um, and obviously never ignoring that women have been doing this for centuries and still are and still do the majority of it, and that we kind of consider it just the, uh, the background noise that makes our homes and our lives go by. Um, so that was a uh, in the flesh um, story. And then, you know, I suppose the other part that I'm in this field is that both my wife and my daughter will say to me, of anything that Promundo does, they say, we have your career right here in our hands. <laughs> We're right. watching you. Right. We are seeing, is your, are you walking the talk? Um, so I have no choice but to be here and be an ally. And, and They're watching, I'm sure. They will, or somebody will send it to them. We're thrilled that you are here. Um, I want to kind of go into sort of the problem we're trying to solve, the challenge, you know, before we go into the potential solutions. But I thought maybe we could focus a little bit on a phrase that you use so we understand your terminology, and that's healthy masculinity. What do you mean by that? Yeah, good question. What, you know, mostly we will ask, I think, a, you know, we will ask boys that question. What is good manhood? And the list will come there. Being genuine, standing up for others, being a good friend, helping your mom out in the kitchen. If we ask boys that question, those are the things that come in there. It is about caring and connection. Um, it is about being able to ask for help when you need it. It is about being able to show vulnerability. It's about having an emotional vocabulary richer than simply anger. It is about believing in a just and equitable world. Um, and I think it's about men seeing our stake in an equitable world. Um, so most of the time we try not to, you know, we have written the academic articles where we define it, we've designed scales for how we measure it. But I think the, the most important one for me is if we ask boys before we send them out into the world with the male peer group or before they spend too much time playing certain kinds of video games or feeling peer pressure to act in a certain way, the words they will use are pretty much what we mean by healthy masculinity. Honoring others, believing in equality, treating your own self well, treating your body well, asking for help, um, and being able to help others. It's pretty obvious stuff. <laughs> um, so I think it makes us flip the question around and says, what are we doing every single day that makes a lot of this unhealthy stuff? Yeah. Because I truly believe that three and four year olds and five year old boys are pulsing with that healthy energy. Mm -hmm. A million questions I could ask you about that, but I'll <laughs> move on to another idea or a similar idea, because I assume something happens along the way that it becomes quite unhealthy. We'll come back to that. Yeah. Tom, um, you know, from a Cummins perspective or even from a personal perspective, what problem are you, you trying to solve? Like when you think about gender equality and gender equity, you know, what's the challenge to you? Yeah, it, it started here. I, I, as I did my travels around the world and I spoke with um, government leaders, business leaders, I go to this thing called the Business Roundtable, which mm -hmm. is the top 200 C, you know, companies in the, in the country, the CEOs from those, country, uh, those companies. So it's, it's big, big CEOs. 
and I you know, met in forums all over the world, almost everyone I talked to, male and female, believe that if women were equal to men, or you know, mostly so, that we would be richer, healthier, and less violent. Like, they all think we will be better off. And they don't mean like they'll be better off, like women. They mean we'll be better off. Our kids will grow up better, people will have more food, you know, more, all the things they want. Developmentally, they, like when you talk to the Indian government, they'll say, no, we'll, we, our economy could be 10, grow 10% 10 GDP for whatever number of years if we could get half these women working, things like that. I mean, really overwhelming, compelling statistics. And if everyone believes it that's in charge, why isn't it doing it? Like, it's weird. Like, it's hard to find a subject where so many people align on that the solution looks like this. And yet, I would guess I would venture to argue that we've made way less progress on such an obvious point than we could have or should have. And I think we have the, the instincts that we have to, especially under stress, to go back to prove things, things with proven ways or nativist ways or whatever, back to the, back to the past, where somehow we thought the, you know, the basic idea is men compete and do warfare and bring home the spoils and women take care of the kids and you know, cook what I want to eat. That thing is in people's heads somewhere and we go back to it under stress. And it just seems like everybody knows that that ain't the best, and yet here we go. And I, I, it's interesting, I was really interested in what Gary said, that like even inside we know that it's wrong. As boys, we already know it's wrong. But people are going to spend the next 20 years teaching us why it's not wrong. So I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to move us closer to the thing we all know is better. We already know it. The data already tells us so. Everything, every experience, the personal and otherwise we have, says it so. And we just aren't moving close enough, fast enough. And I guess I feel urgent about that. I don't know how much longer in my lifetime, you know, all of you would come to see me on stage before I'm just an old man who has to choose between coffee and tea. <laughs> but I, what I think is, as long as I got the audience, I definitely want to talk about it and get it moving because it's just not moving fast enough. Good. There's, we did this movie on Cummins Powers Women, and at the end of the movie, there's a shot of Tom. It's one of my favorite shots of all time. He goes, he looks at the camera and he goes, it's just time to go. <laughs> so we say that all the time, it's just time to go. <laughs> Um, so Gary, you know, kind of riffing off of what we've talked about so far and kind of the idea that somewhere along the way something goes awry yeah. for men and boys, um, can you speak a little bit about the problem um, that you're trying to solve? Yeah. And especially if you can talk about, you know, violence against women, which is a, a scourge. Um, and why is it, why is it prevalent if... if we're born knowing that's wrong, or pretty much knowing it's wrong. What happens, and, and what's the problem? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if we think of boys coming into the world not born to be violent, but born to connect love to be loved, um, that what we do to boys in boyhood is kind of a distortion of who we are. And most of that's on the back of violence. About 60% of boys and men tell us that we have been victims of bullying or some kind of violence from our male peers in school or in our communities. About 40%, depending on the country we look at, say that we've seen our father or another man in the household use violence against our mothers. Um, if we talk about the violence that is watched online or on streaming, we've done some research on that as well, we are bombarding our sons with a huge amount of violence. Um, we make that normal every day. We make it normal in peer groups because no one really interrupts it. Um, we see bullying. We've done some research where we ask boys about their experience of bullying. The vast majority see it when it's happening. The vast majority tell us they want to do something about it, but yet 89% told us they didn't intervene because they were worried that the bully would turn his direction toward them. And I think that's the silence that we watch as men. We don't like it. We've experienced it ourselves. But we feel like there's a huge conspiracy that says, be quiet about it. 
we feel policed by other men. We also asked about how many of the experiences of bullying and about 40% of us experience homophobic violence. Even if in that same survey about 10% define themselves as gay, but we know how much that's so gay and all kinds of other words are used to say, act like a man. And we know what that act like a man is supposed to be. Tough, make sexist jokes, make homophobic jokes, turn away when you see others being bullied. We are all in this as part of a silent conspiracy. And it's really tough as men to break out of it because we see lots of other men going along with it. But we also see lots of men breaking out of it. And I think that's what empowers us to do the change. Men who stood up and said, this cycle can be broken. So Pramundo's, you know, our, our work is founded in that idea. Most violence is carried out by men. Most men aren't violent. All of us as men have something to do to break this. And I think an important part of that as well is to say we've got a stake in this. We as men live better when we become part of the solution, not when we're there simply silent about it. Um, and it's tough because we've been bombarded with years of living in that system to say, I'm going to stand up and talk about this. Um, if I were to call, if we as Promundo will call, call a group of a workplace and say, hey men, come on, let's come to the atrium and talk about violence against women. Voluntary, anybody come? There'd be three people here, if that. Um, if you're made to come and then if I say, hey men, I want to talk to you, suddenly everybody's looking at their shoes or the back of the room or your phone. This is not easy stuff for us, to admit, for us as men to talk about. And I think what we try to bring to our work is that most men, all of us, want to be healthier, connected, caring people. That's, that's our birthright. That is the species that we're part of. Let's build on that. Let's assume that's where you're starting from. That violence is a distortion of who we are, and we can help bring you back. And so this mixture of, you know, Me Too has been a fantastic historical moment for us, for you, for as a firm, as a world, to say we won't tolerate this. But the other part of the equation has to be we've been calling lots of men out, and what we're also trying in our work is to call men in that we all need to be part of the solution. This is for us too. Um, we have a place in this conversation together with the women's rights activists and activists who have been leading the space to be allies in this space and to speak up, not instead of, but next to, with, to listen to. So that's really the, the, the formula that we try to bring. It sounds really easy to say it here in a few sentences, <laughs> to do this at community levels and workplaces with men and women whose lives have been affected by violence, as many of us in this room have had those experiences. We know there's layers of trauma to talk about. We know there's layers of individual household issues who, that continue to happen. We know that you may have had workplace issues that still need to be talked about. So I, I made that sound like a pretty easy formula, but it does really have to be embedded in listening. It's gotta be informed by the trauma that many of us ex have experienced from violence. And it's got to have that compassionate lens that men can and want to do better. Super. And, you know, we're going to have a, by the time we're done with this, we'll have a few more questions about practical solutions. Because, you know, I think, you know, in America, when George Floyd was murdered, we read and heard so much about being an anti-racist and how, how, you, how you are an anti-racist. And I've thought a lot about you the times where I'm sitting in a party and people will say things that are racist and you're frozen sometimes. You're like, you don't want to spoil the party. You don't want to create a big fuss. You know it's, it's racist. And so what are the tools that, you know, give us some tools to think about because there are many similarities to gender violence and, and um, sexism to all sorts of oppressed groups. But hey, hey, Mary, um, before we go, one thing I was thinking about, Gary, I think, one thing I wanted to ask you, maybe ask Gary, is, is that, you know, I, my sense is that we were being manipulated as men by people in power to some degree. Those same people that think it'd be better if women were equal also need soldiers to fight in wars. Interesting. And we need people in coliseums to play football. And we need people in, at work to work all day and night so that we can sell more stuff or whatever, whatever reason we have. And I wonder if to some degree that we create these you know, false views of masculinity because we, you know, we want to use it. To get stuff we done. We want stuff done. We want to invade the other country or we want to protect our country against invasion or whatever. And then, we li then we're forced to live with the consequences, which is that we have half of our population who's trained to be violent. Yeah. 
and and but I, I don't know if that's right historically because I'm neither a historian nor nor a child development person. But I would just it just feels to me I my, my personal memories of playing football are that the two most praised foot people in my, on my football team hit harder than anybody else. It almost like they with abandon their eyes were. Go, and they would just hit so hard, like throw their bodies at people. One died of a drug overdose at 20, the other was in jail by 25. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they were completely unsuccessful people, and the coach loved them. And all I, I just remember I was scared all the time. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm scrawny, but I was scared all the time. <laughs> and, and so I, I just think to myself, like, it was... Did we, did we do those kids a service, really, by training them to, to throw their body with that level of violence at another player in order to win the football game when we were 17? By the way, we lost 33-0 to zero on our homecoming game, so we didn't even win. <laughs> but even if we, I mean, the point is, the, the win doesn't seem worth it to me in that level. Yeah. That level. But I don't know if there's Jerry, a... Jerry, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, we, how long do we have to talk about that one? Of how, you know, how, do, how do we make men violent in the country with the largest military in the world seven times over of our, you know, the next largest military in the world? How do we then not support our troops who come back and we have what seems to be the highest rate of suicide among returning troops of any country that sends its troops into battle? Um, yeah, how do we look at, you know, that in fact that we are the wealthiest country in the world but have one of the highest... Um, murder rates and highest incarceration rates, both of which are men. The vast majority of those who carry out murder are men, um, and the vast majority of our incarcerated population are men. Um, and we do a huge amount of policing in racist ways as well that are, that are pretty obvious. So yes, in our sports industries, in our, you wanna get into Marvel heroes, you wanna get into G.I. Joes, we're, we're, yeah, the, the list is really long. What our boys are playing online um, we did some analysis of that with folks at the Gina Davis Institute. It's a steady diet of, I mean, I sometimes look at the U.S. and how much we spend promoting violent versions of masculinity that I am also terribly relieved and hopeful that we spend a lot of time resisting it every day, too. Mm. There's a lot of men doing the work for their households every day um, who don't get shown in Marvel action heroes that I think um, we also have to look at the other side and say we do a lot of producing of, of, uh, of some good men as well. Um, yeah. So I, I don't want to leave us just on that pessimism that we're, yeah. we're stuck. I'm just trying to think what the There's uniform a lot of, would be. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, the caregiver uniform. Yeah. Uh, like it, or the caregiver like superhero. A, is there like a suit? Yeah, yeah like, the yeah. caregiver superhero yeah. with a diaper bag. <laughs> the cape. A, yeah, the cape. yeah. Diaper bag. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> so pulling up the nose of the airplane here a little bit. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, to both of you, and I'll start with Gary and, and, and Tom can uh, weigh in. Um, tell us how Promundo Promundo affects change. How do you try to address these problems, and there's more than we've even spoken about, and effectuate change? And if you could tell um, our audience a little bit about how we're working with you in Europe, that would be great. Yeah, sure. I mean, two, you know, two points of entry with all that I shared before of how difficult it is to get men to want to join the space. There's two places where we're trying to go kind of to the paths of least resistance. One is engaging men around care, caregiving fatherhood. Um, our global men care campaign, we started it 10 years ago with the lofty idea that men and boys should be doing half of the hands-on care work in the world. Um, that if we want women to be equal in the workplace, and in houses of Congress and Parliament and the rest, um, we have to be doing our share at home. And we have this really audacious idea to convince men that they're gonna like it and it's gonna be good for us. Um, that engaged fatherhood is good for us. We live longer, we're happier. Um, that it is actually a good thing um, for all of us. It's good for women, good for children, good for the world. Um, we're still working on that, you may have noticed. There's a lot still to be done. Um, you asked what we were doing in the off years between our State of the World's Fathers report. We're gathering energy for the rest for the next year. <laughs> um, so fatherhood is one of those. We think there's a point of entry that men want to engage on that. Um, a lot of men are biological fathers. All of us as men have somebody we care for. Um, the other piece that we work on is starting young, and that's the Global Boyhood Initiative and our work with young men. And Cummins has been our partner in getting this off the ground in Europe. 
And what we, we had been doing lots of work with younger men, kind of ages 15 and above, but realized that we had a tremendous moment I was talking about before, how four or five-year-old boys just will come to the table with an energy that's healthy, open to ideas, not yet bringing some of these harmful ideas of masculinities to the table. And we thought we needed to start far younger. So we reached out to a lot of the experts in kind of how boys are raised and, are, and started the Global Boyhood Initiative. We're doing this in the, in the UK, in France, here in the US with the Boys and Girls Club of America, one of our partners. It's gonna get off the ground in Mexico quite soon. And the idea is the problem with boyhood is not boys. Boys are the victims of the boyhood we put them in. So it's parents, it's teachers, it's coaches, it's after school programs, it's the media content makers that we're trying to work with. It's the world that boys come into. Um, so what we're doing is some foundational research to have these conversations, listening first and foremost to boys and their parents. We're developing some tools for teachers and after school programs. We're engaging the media, my colleague Chris, who um, leads our business development team is doing some of that work, leading some of that work. Um, and then also talking to policymakers. Um, one piece that we're building on is UNESCO and the World Bank came out with studies in the last few weeks. Boys are faring worse than girls in 140 countries in the world in terms of educational outcomes. That conclusion is not to say stop doing what we're doing for girls. No, it's to say keep doing those. But we also need to know what's happening with boys at school. A lot of what's happening to boys at school is called harmful masculinity. I don't ask for help. I don't work well with others. I'm more worried about how hard can I hit you than what grade I can get. I'm playing up to a version of manhood that tells me I bully the other, I don't ask the other for help so that I can get a better algebra grade. So we're trying to take advantage of that policy attention to say, let's be worried about our sons, let's use that worry toward believing we can bring boys into this conversation. Um, so we've been thrilled that Cummins was um, among our first supporters to get that off the ground. Okay. And we have big ideas, right, Averill? And then Tom, you know, similarly and internally at Cummins, you know, we've implemented policies to support um, employees, such as paid time off, uh, um, uh, parental leave, dependent care. What are you, you know, what are you hearing from em employees about our efforts, and what are you thinking about, you know, not only for the past but for the future? And maybe you and Gary can talk about. Yeah. What his thoughts are about Well, that. first, I think that, you know, I, I think we have good, a good attitude, but we're catching up on policies, just if I wanted to be just straight about where I think we are. I think we, you know, we, we've launched a lot of good policies recently, and I think we have a lot more to go, because we, you know, we, they're not the same everywhere in the world. We're not, and it, they shouldn't be. I mean, we need to address whatever the issues are, wherever they are in the world, but I do think we need to keep moving on this. I do think that the world's changing and our ability to address people where they are in terms of the right leave policies. I'm super excited to talk to Gary more about that. Um, but I will say, the, the, like the parental leave policy that we implemented a few years ago, I get more emails from men who have taken parental leave than any other benefit that we've ever given. I mean, again, I'm not saying that that's not the only thing they write me about. They write me about all kinds of things. But the only thing that they, they say thank you when they start and, they, and they about a benefit is about that. And I think it ties into what Gary said. I think when the people that write me say not only, of course, they were grateful because, you know, they needed leave or whatever, but because their experience while on leave was so meaningful to them that they just had to write me to tell me about it. And I'm talking about from the Diesel Workers Union, I'm, you know, people that don't always write me. And so that, it is, a, it is obviously a meaningful experience. It is, you know, it's, it's something that we should have done a long time ago. I guess that's, I guess I have some regret about our timing, but as you can hear. But I do think it's something that is important and I think we should continue to look at policies to say, how do we help men be 50% caregivers? Um, and I just think of my own, uh, when, when, when my wife and I for, had our first child, we, we were living at Grandview Lake, which is you know, uh, 30 minutes or so, 20 minutes outside of Columbus. And we had our, our first child when um, and Michelle was working at the time for Cummins and my wife. And after she was on leave for four or six months, I can't remember which. And then when she came back to work, we needed to find infant care. So we found uh, a woman who was um, 
her kids had grown and she, she loved kids, so she would, she would take two infants, two young uh, children. She had one and she would take ours, for which we were very grateful, because there were not many choices. And um, her rule was, you shall pick your child up at 5.30. Not at 5.32 or 5.35, at 5.30. And she kind of let it be known there was a three strikes and you're out rule. Like, you cannot miss. And so from my office in Columbus, it was 30 minutes from the minute I left my office until I arrived at her house. Again, not 28, not 20, 30 minutes <laughs> to get there. And so around 2.30, I started to get anxious because I needed to be kind of getting ready to go about 4.30 and then 10 to 5. And 4.30, you know, that's not that late, right? You guys know that's like, that's way too early to start thinking about getting ready, maybe. Depends on your point of view. And then at 5 o'clock, I had to be walking out the door. And I was nervous every single day. And Michelle and I would switch off. I had two days a week. She'd have three, and then I'd have three, and she'd have two. Every day I was nervous whether I was going to get out in time. And so I just thought about kind of what the extra burden about that is to leave every day. I mean, I was still working hard, by the way. I was still, you know, I still thought I was giving a lot. But the point is, it was, it's just harder, I think, to be, have to have that kind of... There's caregiving, and there's also just meeting the deadlines. Who's got the deadline to meet? It's easier, believe it or not. I mean, it was actually easier to work till 6, because then I didn't have to be anxious all the time about whether my meetings were going to be over in time and whether this person was going to wax prolific for past 10 to 5 and then 10 after 5, and then <laughs> wasn't going to make it. So, so, Gary, you advise corporations, too, on not only on policies, but, but how companies can do a better job. Um, what are some of the things that you talk about and advise companies, and what should we be thinking about? I guess, yeah, I guess the first part that we start the conversation with is to say, all that you're doing to promote women's pay equity in the workplace and to make sure that, you're, um, that your leadership is occupied by 50% women is all urgent, and it's also a response. It's also a, um, you're responding to the problem, not getting at the root of it, which is to say, how can women climb how can there be enough women to be in the applicant pool if they're not supported in doing the care at home? Um, we know the trends that happen in um, wages in this country. If we're early 20s, men and women, our wages are about equal. Then the first child comes along and his wages continue to go up because he stays in the workplace. She takes time off if we're talking about a heterosexual family. And if she comes back, she, may, she is more likely to come back part-time. She's lost a couple of years from the workplace. And then the next child comes along and the cycle repeats and the gap gets wider. No country in the world has achieved that has, has gotten rid of the pay gap between men and women because no country in the world has achieved, has gotten rid of the gap between who does the care at home. Um, and so part of where we think businesses have a huge amount to do is to make men's caregiving normal. One, to make sure you support women caregivers. But if we really want to get at this thing that we call the gender binary, this huge inequality, we've got to push men to do our part of the care work. Parental leave policies are one of the key ones. I know that you, your policy talks about primary and secondary. One thing that we advise is get rid of that idea um, and go with the idea that we're all caregivers. Um, let's make it normal that men do this while we support women to do it. Um, we think you should never reduce the number of days for women to give them for men. You should top it up for men. Um, Can and you say that one again? <laughs> never, never I, I reduce. Sure. Never reduce. So if you're looking at a law in a country or if you're looking at a corporation and you say we give six weeks for women or 12 weeks for women and we're giving four weeks for men, don't take away weeks for her to oh, give to him. Top it up. Move what you offer for her, offer for him. Mm. Corporations, city governments, nations worry this is going to make you unproductive. Men are going to stay home and be fathers forever and not come back to the workplace. <laughs> it doesn't happen. We will come back. Um, we advise the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., um, on, on the legislation. We had the huge opposition from the Chamber of Commerce that said, if you make us do this, if you make paid leave and we pay for it under a payroll tax, we're going to be uncompetitive. And we said, do you know how much it costs to do it? It's 0.65% of a payroll tax to offer eight weeks leave. And we made it not couple-based, but individual-based. Eight weeks for both. 
Two years into it, they said, oh, not only is it not breaking us, we could keep it at 0.65% of a payroll tax and we could increase it to 12 weeks because everybody wants it and every city council member has figured out they're gonna get reelected if they go for it. So dare I say CEOs <laughs> or you know, city council members can get, uh, get points for this. Men and women want it. And then the third part is to say, even if you offer it, many men feel like I shouldn't take it because mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be the overachiever, right? We all are, men and women here. Um, but we as men really feel that our peer group um, is not really supportive of, should we take it? Or that if we take it, it's kind of like, yeah, take your six weeks and come back and then I have your soul again. Oh. As opposed to saying, how do we help you over the course of a child? My, that baby that I was the caregiver for, um, when she was a newborn, is now 24 years old. I'm very clear of how caregiving goes on for far more years than we think. Um, that we need time and support to do this overall. So think about it beyond birth or adoption. Think about the caregiving that many of us do for elder parents as well. Um, I think we were doing some management of that, all of us in the meeting room before this. Think about how you set the model for it. So the taking off at 5.30, or at 5, sorry, so you're there for 5.30. Making it clear that all of us as workers here kind of imagine in our heads that I see a network of who you care for as I talk to you. That you're not just in the meeting to finish that report or that project, but that all of us in here have this mesh of people who need us outside of here too. Um, and it works. Corporations who do it show better profit, better retention. Workers want to stay with them. They want to say, they want to wear Cummins on their t-shirt and get it tattooed on their arm. If you do that for them, it's pretty obvious. I think you know that. Anyway. It is. Awesome. It is. Hey, and I, I've got, hey, oh, can I just one yeah. uh, personal experience that, and it might help too. I, I do think that um, we could as bosses when there is a man who we know is uh, having a child coming up assume that they're going to take time off and start scheduling with them. So don't make them do the formal ask and say, well, I'll be needing to take this time. Just say, like, I assume you'll be taking time off. So shall we start working on planning your work? Because planning work is the hard part, right? Trying to figure out who am I going to offload to who. And we as bosses could do that. We, you know, we know the woman who's very pregnant is going. So we, and we do that. So why couldn't we do it with their spouse if we know? I mean, obviously, if, you know, it's not our place to, to, to make them tell us, but if we know, we should just do it. Just do it as a regular matter. Just say, like, hey, I know you're going to be off, so let's do it. The, the second thing I thought of is that, you know, I, I do think to, to be responsible in this regard as a man, you do have to take ownership for your own work-life balance. Most, uh, Tony and I have both have talked about this before. Like, there was a moment in our career where we just decided to say, like, we're responsible. It's not our boss. It's not someone else who has to tell us we have to leave if we're going to be home. And if we don't go home, it's no one's fault but our own. That was a decision we had to make. We have to, I have to leave. And then it turned out my boss was fine with it. You know, I had to make adaptations and things like that, and, but I, they were fine. It was my own invention, my own interpretation of the culture and whatever that I was causing me to not leave. Maybe, maybe to avoid chores, I'm not clear. But to, in, in any case, the point is, whatever I was doing was causing a lot of consternation and unfairness and, and, yeah. and, and problems with, my, with Michelle. And as soon as I took ownership for it, and when I went home, I said, I'm late because I kept talking when I should have shut up and come home. I all of a sudden stopped doing that because it's embarrassing when you have to say, I'm late because I blew it. It's much easier to say, you know, Linebarger made me stay. Mm. But if I have to say, I'm, I stayed, then, it's, then you just don't do it that often. So I just think, you know, as care, joint caregivers, just making sure that we're taking accountability for being, that, being there when we said we would be there, taking ownership over the tasks. We said the caregiving task, it's our deal. It's not our company's deal. You know, because I don't know how many spouses I talk to that hate the company, but it's not a few. It's a lot. And I think the reason they don't like our company is because their spouse told them the reason they weren't there is because of us, because of me. And it's not true. I'm I, I just telling you, it ain't true. So my question is just own up to it because it's, it's your deal. And again, I'm not saying you won't have a bad boss that'll make, you make it difficult for you because you might, but that's not, that's not most of it. Most of it is just us taking responsibility, I think. 
That, that kind of um, segues into a last question, and I don't know if we have time for questions after that 10 minutes. I think we, I think we can, don't you think? <laughs> so so the, kind of the last question I wanted to ask you before we you know, uh, turn the microphone over is practical solutions. Can you give us one or two things to focus on? We've kind of self-selected into this discussion, so I'm assuming that you guys are the, the willing. Um, but for, for all of us, what can we do to advance gender equality um, and especially, of course, course focused on, on men and boys. Go ahead, Gary. Start with me? Yeah. I mean, well, you know, I suppose maybe obvious the first one that I'll say, but, um, you know, five, six, seven, eight year old boys, even young adolescent boys, are not going to come up to you randomly and say, could you talk to me about what a healthy relationship looks like? <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it is on us to have this conversation with boys. And I hear a lot from parents and as father of a daughter, you know, I know there, there's a lot that we've done to make the world, we're not done, but to make clear what we think, you know, empowered women can be in the world. And I think we've done a lot less to say, what does it mean to be a healthy, connected, nonviolent man? Um, and I think those conversations are ones that all of us who interact with boys need to have. And we're not gonna stop having conversations with our daughters, but I think one is, we need to talk about this earlier. Um, during the Me Too moment, had lots of parents come up and say, parents of boys, I'm worried that my son is going to get called out for doing, you know, in, unfairly for something he might do to a girl. And my response was always, well, what is he doing to girls? Um, and, and realizing that that fear of, well, I don't know how to have that conversation with him about what consent is, what a healthy relationship is, how to think about his own sexual desire in ways that aren't what he thinks others have told him it should be. One, I would say, go out and make your sons watch Sex Education on Netflix. If you, gotta that watch that on to be Netflix. Last. You're gotta to be. watch that. It's amazing. <laughs> it's a really thoughtful one. <laughs> so, you know, Promundo, Promundo approved uh, <laughs> show really about funny. you know the complexity of how we learn about <laughs> sexual relationships. Um, so I think one is talk to your sons. The other is, I think... Does it, does it matter who talks to them? You know, I'm happy if the bus driver does, because I think, yes, the bus driver and, and you as parent and you as uncle um, and you as, you know, as, as cousin or older sister or older brother. Um, I think, you know, it's, and it's not like, let's sit down and let me read to you, um, you know, this list of what a group has defined of what healthy sexuality is, but how to make that part of the conversation. All right, go ahead. Okay. Um, and the other, I would say, is you know, to, to live the, to walk this talk, to show at home as a, you know, as somebody in the workplace here that you're saying, oh, did we think about when we set up this meeting that anybody who needs to leave early to get home to do the care work can do that, that all of us need to be part of that conversation. Um, and it does make our lives more difficult. You gotta stop and say, hmm, we did set that up in a way that it made it difficult for those people to be there. What does that mean? Those people are usually women. Um, and we as men have just gotten really used to that, that it's women who pick up the phone because they've got to deal with the caregiving issue at home. How do we make that normal so that all of us do? Or that we stop a meeting at 4.30 and say, hey, I realize that some of us may have to get, you know, get home to caregiving stuff. How is it? And it's not a penalty if we have to stop right there. So it's finding those kind of micro decision moments that really do set the tone of making it normal that all of us have those care duties. It's so smart. I don't know if we do it. You could ask Chris whether Chris is an expectant um, father. And I think, you know, like each, it, it's easy to stand up here on stage and say it, but like, you know, do we practice it as an organization? Are we doing it? Do we really get into the details of it that, re that become really important? Yeah. And Tom, anything else that you wanted to add in terms of things that we can do? He covered the point about talking to your sons. I, that's really important to me. I, I th and I think you know, men should talk to their sons. I mean, I think just yes. talking about where boundaries are and should be for you is really important. And, and then I guess the, the other thing I was thinking of is that it seems um, that a, a lot of us haven't thought about what's in it for us as much as what is in it for women. I just wondered if we got a little bit more tangible in our own minds about what's in it for us. If, the play, if we really reach this idea that everybody's got the same opportunity and everybody's got, you know, again, which doesn't mean you can't be a caregiver. 
solely if that's what you want to do. It doesn't mean that. It means you, you can do that. It doesn't mean you can't be um, splitting it equally. You can, uh, but the point is we are choosing as fits our life and work. If we get, reach that point of equality and we all get that, um, what's in it for us as men? Because to me, it feels like a lot. The question is, how does it feel like to you? Do you feel like you're giving something up or do you feel like you're getting something? Because the more I think we can see it as something in it for us, the easier it is for us to talk to our friends about, you know, if we did this, you, here's what it could be for you. Like, you know, when I, when, I, when I was taking care of my kids, it was super fun. Like, I, I had so much fun. It was so good to get out of that office and go play with my kids. Like, I can't tell you how good that was. And the, I think that, I just don't know if those conversations happen enough among men because I'm not sure we're tangible enough about what's in it for us. I think, yeah, so Avril's giving me the sign, so I want to wrap mm. with one question to Gary. Is there cause for optimism? Oof. Yeah, I think there is. Um, and because I'm empowered by, inspired by, and in this work because of so many women who have put their lives and well-being on the line to fight for gender equality, it is having an impact. Um, and I suppose if where I find optimism is listen to a group of young women. Um, they are not going to take shit from us. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, if I, you know, if I feel pessimistic at times, I listen to my daughter and some of her friends of what they are demanding around around full rights and respect for sexual diversity, mm -hmm. the way they talk about you know, how I define who I am in the world. And they're clearly telling us we're going to do it whether you like it or not. So, the yeah, the power of young women is going <laughs> to... Uh, is driving us. All right. And Mary, uh, I think I'm optimistic too because there's so many men doing amazing things yeah. out there. I'll, I'll never forget this. I, I spoke to the first, one of the graduating classes. I think it may have been the first of mechanical engineering at the, at the Cummins College for Engineering for Women in, in Pune. And I looked out at the audience. And remember, in, in India, sending your, your daughter to college, is you know, that, that was a, mo a, a, step, a, a brave step anyway. And then sending them to engineering school, mechanical engineering school, was another brave step. And so they all put, they all, you know, had to get out of the way of their daughters doing it, which may sound like, okay, so what, they got out of the way, but it's a brave step. It's a step that actually set their family up, I think, and their community up for more wealth, more knowledge, more, you know, better things to come against the advice probably of their parents and their peers and everybody else. And they took the brave step because they knew it was the right thing to do. So I think men are also doing many brave and important things today to kind of buck it, buck the culture and say, we're not going to do it. So I also have optimism about that. Again, I, do I think it needs to go a lot faster? Sure, I do. Yep. But I do have optimism about it. That's great. Mm. Cool. So to everyone, um, welcome back to the office. Mm -hmm. um, to Gary and Tom, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. I'm optimistic. And uh, in the words of time, Tom Leinbarger, it's just time to go. Time to go. <laughs> <laughs>